Dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank the Centre for European Studies and Prime Minister Katainen for organising and hosting this event and giving us the opportunity to share the ideas on what challenges Europe is facing and what next steps are to be uh, taken. Uh, and indeed, uh, there is a whole lot of issues Europe needs to deal with, deficits and debt, lack of growth and lack of competitiveness, lack of jobs and discontent of many of its citizens. So certainly there are also many policy responses we need to think of in order to deal with all those uh, uh, issues. And in this case, when you have so many challenges to deal with, it's quite important to set the right uh, uh, priorities. And I think, I think there are three uh, priorities where we should concentrate. First is really to ensure its citizens and its uh, uh, political leaders, among them, commitment to the European project. It's uh, strongly interlinked with a uh, uh, second issue, which is uh, strengths of European economy and what we can do about this. And the third is the power of values uh, of uh, EU members, which we can share and promote globally. So those uh, aspects are certainly interlinked, but I will try to deal with them uh, one, one by one. So first of the uh, citizens' attitude. This is one of the issues which is becoming ever more urgent that we are seeing that there's uh, ever more discontent or disengagement of European citizens from the European uh, project. And uh, probably it's not uh, a big surprise because so far the policy response has been concentrated into to deal with the issues uh, concerning the governance of EMU and the government's governance of the EU in general. And certainly those were very important issues to deal with. But uh, the policy response was less concentrated uh, to deal with uh, people's main concern and its uh, jobs and growth. And especially in terms of short-term solutions to ensure a brighter outlook for the people. Uh, Bill Clinton's 1992 presidential uh, campaign has uh, gone down in history as a it's the economy stupid campaign. And initially it was meant to be for internal campaign use only, but somehow this slogan was so powerful that it became a main uh, issue of the whole campaign. And apparently we are now also in the times in European Union when economic issues have overshadowed all the other concerns in people's minds, and it means that we need to concentrate on economy and we need to concentrate on jobs and growth. And uh, <coughs> uh, this uh, is bringing me to one of the particular points I wanted uh, to make, that reforming European economy and making it more competitive is a core priority for long-term EU strengths and it's uh, absolute necessity to reform now and to invest now uh, so that we are in a position to bear fruits in five or ten years. But the current circumstances dictate that it's not enough uh, to be merely going uh, into the right uh, direction. By the time we will arrive there, despite being more competitive, or uh, we might end up also in a completely different political landscape. One which would not favor or prefer further European integration, or maybe not even want a European Union at all. So the risks are huge. Therefore, we must increase our pace, turn our focus, and to deliver as soon as possible. And I'm convinced that creating new jobs and fixing the economy would do a lot more to address the discontents of the EU citizens than uh, new discussions on uh, treaty changes, for, for example. Uh, implementation of pan-European initiatives to create jobs or promote growth are much better signals to the foster, uh, foster favorable view of the EU than raising concerns about uh, democratic uh, deficit does.
And to give you an example, Youth Guarantee Program is a very good example of pan-European initiative that has been speedily adopted and addresses an urgent problem that is present in many member states. If we manage to address these problems, much of the rest would sort out itself. Public discontent would wane, support for the European project would grow, support for further reforms, strengthening competitiveness would also raise. So, and the Eurosceptics in this case would lose their firepower. However, one of the most important uh, parts of the legislations and reforms we are dealing right now is the banking union because the fragility of the banking system so far has uh, been uh, one of the uh, issues of, the, uh, of this crisis which still needs to be dealt with, uh, meaning that fragile, fragile banks are hurting fragile sovereigns, fragile sovereigns hurt fragile banks, and so on. We are going into this vicious uh, circle. And uh, uh, so far ECB has, uh, and uh, also uh, EU's policy response has uh, managed to stabilize the markets for foreign debt, but however, the bank's uh, weak balance sheet still prevents them from lending to the private sector. The problem is that uh, is to the different extent prevent, uh, present in many European countries. Uh, this February, Bruegel Institute published the policy contribution which sought to answer an interesting question concerning the necessity of the banking union. It read, can Europe recover without credit? And the finding was that uh, although there are quite a few precedents of creditless recoveries, it's, in like, uh, it's unlikely to happen in the Eurozone due to the two reasons. First, it's being high income economy where such recoveries have been much more rare. And second, all such recoveries involved, involved currency devaluation or depreciation, which in the current global climate does not seem to be uh, plausible to happen. Uh, this leads to the simple conclusion. EU is unlikely to resume healthy growth unless we make credit available again. This is a case for urgent, uh, uh, urgency regarding the implementation of uh, banking union. Then coming to the second question on the economic strengths. And we have a dual aspect of this uh, 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 problem. It's uh, first of all the question of dealing with a deficit and debt, but it's also the question of dealing with our competitiveness problems. So first on uh, deficit and uh, debt. This is certainly an issue which was uh, we had been dealing for a previous years, and this austerity versus the, the growth debate has been a central part of the policy debate for the last couple of uh, years. Uh, and it's also quite clear that if you are in a situation where you are not having financial stability, you better act quickly to restore financial stability, because without financial stability, you are not able to uh, return to the economic growth. But it's also clear that only bringing down deficits or, or dealing with the budget balances uh, will not return EU to the growth by itself. So, uh, but uh, before I move to this uh, competitiveness issue, I still uh, wanted to uh, make another point on a uh, debt levels. Uh, currently, we see that, uh, yes, public debts uh, had been increasing during the last years, but it, if you look uh, purely at, uh, at the figures, uh, we see that uh, public debt in the EU as a whole is currently just below 90% of GDP. In Eurozone, it's just above 90% of GDP. In US, it's uh, somewhat over 100% of GDP, and in Japan it's well over 200% of GDP. So you cannot explain uh, this uh, issue only with the level of public debt. But it's also uh, clear that we are coming gradually to the moment where we will not be able to rely on ever-increasing public debt as a driver for growth. And indeed we may ask 
is this uh, really a driver for growth? And uh, on this uh, context, uh, my uh, favorite example is uh, to compare experiences of uh, uh, Latvia and Estonia. We started in 1990, 1991 from uh, quite uh, similar uh, positions. And by now, Estonia has accumulated public debt somewhere of 10% of GDP. Latvia has accumulated public debt of somewhat like 40% of GDP. And then one could ask, so what exactly Latvia has reached with those extra 30% of GDP public debt? If we look and uh, compare two countries, we see that uh, GDP per capita is higher in Estonia, average wages higher in Estonia, average pension is higher in Estonia. So what exactly we achieved with this money? Uh, one thing which we have achieved is that we are spending more on interest payments, which leads to the point that really uh, living on the debt is not paying out in a long term. And gradually, uh, uh, I think we also need to change this philosophy in Europe that you cannot indefinitely live on debt. And at the end of the day, it's not even paying off. Uh, then uh, coming back to the uh, question of uh, competitiveness. This is another issue which we need to address uh, if we are to return to the economic uh, growth. And the uh, World Economic Forum has put it very well. High levels of prosperity in Europe cannot be sustained over time without high levels of competitiveness. And that's uh, pretty much uh, what it is. And we need to deal with the competitiveness uh, issue both at the national levels and uh, here again uh, to make some uh, comments from the World Economic uh, Forum. If you look at the aggregate EU competitiveness performance according to the Global Competitiveness Index and compare it to the performance of the EU, uh, US, we clearly see pronounced gaps in certain areas, notably innovation and labor market efficiency. And also similar areas emerge if we compare the more competitive countries with the less competitive countries within the EU. Innovation is an area where the whole EU is lagging behind the US, uh, but areas like institutions, labor market efficiency and good market, uh, good market efficiency are areas in which some of the EU countries are very good performers, while others are again lagging uh, behind. The implication of this comparison uh, is that uh, a lot can be improved if member states would simply uh, learn from each other and implement best practices. And I see that this, uh, the area where actually, this is the area where actually better coordination at the EU level would be very uh, beneficial. And then if you look at the competitiveness in the EU level, Probably one of the most urgent issues we need to do is to utilize the full potential of the EU internal market to fully implement existing legislation, uh, services directive to give one example, uh, but also uh, to concentrate on new areas like creating, for example, a digital single market, because so far we have probably 27 or soon 28 uh, digital markets and really we should uh, move to the digital single market and to give some uh, figures, some estimates that 15% uh, uh, <coughs> increase in dig digital retail would provide another gain of 1.7% of the EU's uh, GDP. So. Um, there are many industries uh, where harmonizing regulations and bringing down market barriers would result in better outcomes for the economy and more competitive industries to compete in markets beyond our uh, region. So, uh, and to come to my last point of this uh, speech is on uh, common uh, values. And this is certainly one of the strengths uh, we have, that uh, it's known that uh, any uh, economy's influence in the world is not determined only by the size of it, but also by the ideas it promotes, by the values uh, that it seeks to protect, and by the, amount of the, uh, by the amount they share with the rest of the world. 
in terms of aid, in terms of cooperation, and in terms of advocating uh, for a common co uh, cause. And no doubt, the European Union is currently at the forefront of the world in many of these aspects. The risks, though, are associated with our lack of competitiveness, which I already touched, and also the lack of the consensus within the EU. There is no point for the EU bodies to implement policies that member states are not fully behind with. And it goes both ways. Also, the member states must realize that uh, they have a, uh, a role as a part of the whole of the EU, and that they must uh, bear the responsibility associated with it. On the other hand, uh, for the EU bodies, it means that they must constantly check their agenda against the concerns of EU citizens and that they must be able to determine priorities according to this. Thus, I'm convinced that addressing the economy now and our long-term competitiveness needs to go, uh, uh, would go a long way to solidify the member states around the EU values, but for this to happen, the awareness that we are in the same boat, to put it simply, is absolutely crucial. So uh, the extent to which Europe is strengthened by the, uh, this regard depends on the extent that the European uh, member states can reach a consensus on their common values, goals and purpose of action, and to enact those values in action both at the level of EU and nationally. This sounds like a vicious circle. The extent of agreement on common values determines the strengths of the common values. But it's, uh, it is a mutually enforcing relationship and it's not a vicious circle, but rather a virtuous circle. And I wish we would all, all enter this virtuous circle. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>